So, if there was ever a year where you could have snuck up on me and spanked me in the carrot growing, uh, this would have been the year. Uh, I have never grown carrots, believe it or not, in nothing but sandy soil. With the uh, development of my new dream garden, I grew carrots in one of those plots, and, and everybody knows if, if they watch much of our videos, that soil's a lot different than my sandy plots. And, and so now it, it does help me kind of understand the struggles of some people that have harder soils and growing carrots in them. And, and let me just tell you what I've learned. So first of all, let's start off with this one. This is a bigger one here. So this is the Viper variety. And Viper is an imperator carrot, which means it's supposed to be real long and skinny. Bugs Bunny carrot. No, no, no. Uh -oh. Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny carrot is a Danvers. It's okay. real wide up top and tapers. So this is supposed to be an imperator type long skinny carrot had it been grown in sandy soil it'd probably be that long and a lot skinnier grown in that soil it looks more like a regular nantes type carrot some of these others like these nantes type carrots grown in that soil look more like a chantonay or them short stubby carrots and you know i planted three or four different varieties of orange ones and, and besides having a little label there in front of the row once i pull them i really can't tell them apart whereas in my sandy soil i could tell them so growing them in that harder soil kind of it smushes them together they're a little stubbier uh or a lot stubbier they're, well, they're wider well, and shorter personal size carrots personal it, size carrots. Got you out there. and i still may have a shock because my carrots are still <coughs> in the ground and i checked on them yesterday and you got good sandy soil i got good sandy soils and i'm doing pretty good with you, your weed pressure and don't take it well away. i'm a little bit behind you so i'm gonna leave them in there a little bit longer but uh this may be the year to carrot for horse here this it might be it might be um but uh, so it's not a failure by any means. That's that's good eating size carrot yeah. right there. You throw that in a roast and uh, that in there looks like it's got my name on it. Yeah, that ought to be good and sweet. And if you folks out there, if you've never grown carrots at the house or in your backyard, the sweetness of a homegrown carrot mm. it, it's almost like comparing homegrown English peas to store bought English peas. There really ain't no comparison in the crispness and the sweetness and um some of my one of my favorite smells in the world is fresh dug carrots. carrots that's it's a, it's a nice nice smell too hmm. um before we get any further let's say hey to everybody hello everyone and welcome to our weekly row by row garden show i'm travis and i'm greg and uh we're excited that you're joining us tonight uh, we've got a really good show planned and this is your first time joining our show Go ahead and hit that subscribe button and that bell notification button down below so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. And if you're a frequent viewer of our channel, it's always good to have you back. Um, so we got carrots. I've been pulling a row or so at the time. Uh, it's kind of how I do it. And uh, we put them in our vegetable bags and we've been eating a lot of them too. Made a nice little, in the air fryer the other night, made a nice little roasted beet Medley. Carrot medley, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are we through with them? Yeah, you can snack on them if you want to. You can take those with you. You can, you can hold on to those. Brought those just for you. Bless you. Um, well, besides carrots, <clears throat> what else I got going on? So we've showed this cabbage the last few. We, we've kind of been going back and forth. You brought your cabbage, talked about how you like to grow the personal size cabbage. And, and uh, I was a little bit braggadocious about my big cabbages no I more than a little bit you rubbed it in a little harder uh, than I thought and, and I got to you know I got feeling pretty bad about that and um I had a little talk with myself out in the garden the other day and I said you know what I ain't gonna grow them old big old basketball cabbages anymore called a cabbage for a couple reasons um the main reason is is my my little plastic bags that I use for my vegetable bag operation they won't fit in there I can't get them around there and so what I was having to do is take a crate and just load up eight of them big old cabbages in there. And when my wife does the bag deliveries, she's yeah. texting and cussing me all day because she's having to haul 80 pound of cabbage around. And uh, so it just caused a lot of problems. She was Nobody wants some big old gaudy cabbage. Well, that's the reason I don't want <laughs> Yeah. Well, it, 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 it does become a problem after time. It's a good problem to have. But uh, but yeah, I, I 
I'm not trying to grow them as big, and I'll, I'll show you. This is, I'll show you that I, I am actually able to grow a personal size cabbage. So, this is right, a Savoy. This right here is a Savoy King cabbage. Mine's ready too. I, in fact, we ate one out of the did garden. Did you plant some of these? I did. We ate one. Uh, we made what we call a, a country salad out of it, where you chop it up like coleslaw. And there, so we we, uh, we ate one a couple nights. Since your rule is we got to clean them up so they don't look bigger than they are. So there you go, right there. Good personal size cabbage. You make you a nice mess of coleslaw out of that. Mine was probably a little bit more uniform where yours all cone headed shaped <laughs> up. Mine was probably a little more uniform or round, but it was about yeah. the same size. Some of mine are, are more round, some of mine are kind of swoosh. Now, I will admit, I did, I stacked these in on a double row, playing them pretty tight, and it may be a space issue why they kind of. But uh, I tell you, I really like that variety there. I, I like it too. It's got a good. I don't know if flavor. it was a fluke or what but it seemed to be a little bit more resistant to the worms than my other cabbage did hmm now i didn't have any worms in either of mine well i did have a few but i they seem to be uh it seemed to be a little bit better on the uh on the worm issue you know i didn't push these as hard as i did them cheers cabbage and i don't you might could grow these that big but i think with these that right there is, oh, is, yeah. a, is a that's a plenty of cabbage for a family of four yeah I mean, yeah. Why do you want something that big? <laughs> well, sometimes you just got to prove to yourself you can do something. Mm -mm. So, that's Savoy King cabbage there. That's good stuff, folks, if you've never grown some of that. Uh, this is what them folks make. Uh, we had a, a couple come by here, and um, the, the wife, she was, was it Korean, maybe? Yeah. Um, and, and they grow a ton of this stuff and make kimchi out of it. And now, I've never made any. Is that, that's a fermented deal, ain't it? Yeah, it's like a fermented cabbage. I think you might put some carrots in there. And uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've seen it. I've never tried it. I, I would like to try it. But she said they, they grow a heap of it, and then they have a big family get-together. Uh, I remember and that. And they make their uh, kimchi. So uh, that's that's what you need if you're going to grow. Some people will call this Napa cabbage, too. Mm -hmm. uh, Savoy, Napa, kind of same thing. Well, you know, it's been kind of wet here last few days and this past valentine's day and all the old timers say you got to get them taters planted on valentine's day when it's been a little too wet we ain't been able to get our taters in and, and i can tell you you've been getting a little bit nervous i have but but I, I i took me a preventive measure yesterday and uh i don't know why i didn't think of this sooner but sometimes you just need somebody to kind of hit you in the head and jog your memory oh tom matthews was well i was fussing about being too wet on my video and that's why we didn't have a Wednesday video this week because it's just too wet to do anything. Um, he said, "Well, what you got all you you sell tarps, don't you? I know you got tarps. Why don't you put your tarps down and keep it from getting any more wet than this?" So yesterday, me and little Ty Ty got out there. We got us a load of bricks. We got us two tarps. Took two of them for that big tater plot. And uh, now, now it, it did in my mind. I said, "Man, this is." Which it only took us about thirty minutes. I said, "This is something, you know." I'm spending all this time doing this for something I'm going to take off in two days. But I just couldn't afford, if I would have let it get rained on all day like it's rained all day today, then that was going to push me back probably another three or four days. And uh, Like so I tell it was I bothering you, but I got some news for you. Uh -huh. Everybody out there has always got this buddy that's an overachiever. He right. wants to get everything done a day before everybody else does where he can brag about it. Hey, yeah, you know, you, talk about you got your neighbor, your buddy, that says, well, I got my tater spending on the 13th because he bumped you up a day. <laughs> if it's too wet and you can't get out, do not stress because I have planted my <clears throat> potatoes a plenty of times at the end of February and they'll be fine and grow off. So let your buddy talk that smack all he wants to and you get out there and plant your taters when you can. Don't get in no hurry. Don't get upset. Don't get confused. Just kind of go with the flow and when you can get out there, get them planted and I can promise you they'll be fine. We got a pretty good window. We got a three three week window anyway. I feel like we planted early March before and still been all yeah, right. Yeah, you'd, you'd be fine. So everybody out there that's got some bad weather issues, don't don't let your buddy get you up sitting up tight. And if you do got a tarp or something like yeah. that, you can use uh, to put it on there to keep it from getting any more wet. Because I know there's a lot of people, especially around Mississippi over there, they had a lot wetter than we are. Well, they got flooding stuff over that way. Uh, yep. So uh, I mine should be, since I got it tarped off, I'm going to pull that off tomorrow or Friday. Saturday supposed to have some good sunshine. I'm going to pull it off Friday, let it dry out one more day, and I'm going to plant taters Saturday or Sunday, uh, hell or high water. 
If it don't rain no more. Hell or high water. Yeah, okay. What I, one thing I want to talk about, we talked about tomatoes last week and uh, <clears throat> all the different varieties of tomatoes we carry. And uh, it just it, talking to different customers and people and watching different YouTubers talk about their tomato, uh, their favorite varieties of tomatoes, it just got me thinking, got me wondering. Uh, now, there is a big hoopla, heirloom tomatoes, you know, that's a big buzzword. There's a big hoopla out there about that. And, uh, and I've grown my fair share of heirloom tomatoes over the years. And uh, in comparison to something like that Bella Rosa or that Brickyard, uh, to me, and I might offend some people by saying this, but I'm going to put it out there. I think heirloom tomatoes are overrated. Well, I could agree with you a little bit on that. The I Bella Rosa, they're not good, I but know, I think they're overrated. And I enjoy a good heirloom every now and then. But those those Bella Roses and those uh, Brickyards is a beef steak type tomato, which is what we're used to eating. It's what we was raised on. And I'm gonna tell you that flavor is absolutely wonderful. The key is is, is letting it get vine ripe on that tomato plant, and go out there and picking it, carrying it to the house, slicing it, and eating it. It's got a wonderful flavor to it. Most people don't understand what a good tomato is supposed to taste like because they go down to the grocery store and buy them old tomatoes down there that was picked green and gassed. It ha don't have the same flavor to it. Well, that, see, that was my thoughts. Either, either folks don't know what a good tomato is supposed to taste like or they got a different taste preference than what we got. Now, we tend, we like tomatoes. We like a good canning sauce tomato. Also good on a sandwich. We like a good acidity. You know, a high acidity tomato. You want that tang there, just a little bit of sweetness. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and that Bella Rosa is is just fits our what we like in tomato. Put perfectly. it up against any of them. And uh, I think it may go back to the point that the heirlooms were never gassed and they was always <clears throat> picked maybe a little bit fresher. People may got used to that versus the ones, the hybrids that were brought in the grocery store and gassed, picked green and gassed. I don't know. I know one thing. Jason over at Cog Hill will tell you the same thing. Yeah, I was just texting him the other day, and uh, we were talking about tomatoes, and uh, he said, I've grown a ton of them. And he said, I grew that Bella Rosa for the first time last year, and uh, he said, I've grown a lot of tomatoes, and that Bella Rosa is by far the best. And he said it wasn't even close. Uh, yeah. So he said he'd grown them for his kin folks, and they all agreed too. Again, I think the key to it is is letting that tomato grow on a good, healthy tomato and letting it get vine ripe. Makes a world difference in the taste of the tomato. And if you city folks out there have never grown you a tomato and had a good one off the vine and went down there and sliced it and put you some mayonnaise, some good Duke's mayonnaise on some good fresh light bread, whew, you won't, I don't buy tomatoes in a grocery store. I don't buy tomatoes in a grocery store because I don't like them. It just didn't do anything for me. Yeah. I'll just wait till I can grow them. Because well, I get disappointed every time I buy one down there, so I just quit. Well, it's interesting. I think I've told you this before. With our vegetable bag thing we, did, we do, uh, there's certain crops a lot of people get fired up about. You know, the cauliflower, broccoli, stuff like that. And, and, and we get real fired up when tomatoes start getting ready. But my vegetable bag people uh, don't really get fired up about the tomatoes. Because they don't know what a good tomato is supposed and to I, taste like. I, I, think, I think you're right. Uh, so we grow them for ourselves. The, the tomatoes we grow kind of like the English peas. They for us, we don't really uh, distribute a whole if lot. If you want to see me in a good mood, you come by here with my tomatoes are coming in and with my watermelons is coming in. <laughs> I'm gonna be smiling from ear to ear, walking around out in circles. Uh, speaking of seeds, so we had uh, we got some uh, some different Facebook ads and stuff running out there. So a lot of people that don't know us uh, are seeing us for the first time and stuff like that. And we have some people complaining about the shipping charge if they just order one seed pack uh, so mm. if, if you, you bought from us before you probably know this any order between zero and 49 dollars your shipping is 4.99 yes if you order one seed pack your shipping is going to be 4.99 but there's a reason behind that and i can promise you we don't ever profit from our shipping prices it costs just as much to send one pack of seed as it does 10 15 packs and whereas most seed companies out there are shipping stuff snail mail sure post or smart post or some of those uh options that can take a couple weeks we're shipping all of our seed packets first class first class so you get them in uh, 
as long as there's no holidays, usually anywhere in the country in two to three days. Yeah, now Christmas and some bad weather can throw that off a little bit, but the post office has gotten pretty pretty good about delivering pretty quick, especially on our first class stuff. I'm amazed sometimes how quick people get things. Yeah. So they're pretty good. I hate to brag on them too much, but they've gotten pretty good. Their, their efficiency, it seems to me, has gotten better as of lately. And we have a lot of people on our Road by Road group on Facebook that, that brag about our fast shipping, and we... We like to keep it that way, and that's what we pride ourselves yeah. on. And I I'll always tell people this: that we're the fastest shipping company in the seed industry. One more thing: when we ship out a packet of seeds, it's got a tracking number according right. to it. A snail mail don't have a that cost extra for you to get a tracking number. It cost us extra for you to get a tracking number sent to you. So that's one of the benefit that you get. You have to pay a little extra for it, but you get that tracking number. Know exactly when it's coming out. There again, we try to get those orders out same day, so you get those get those seed orders quick. And look here, we got one speed around here. Yeah, I had a, I had a couple folks on one of those ads that were saying, well, it's still cold. I'm up here in the Northeast, and it's still cold. I don't need these for a couple more weeks. Just ship them, and just put them in an envelope. I said, listen, buddy, we got one speed, and that's wide open, wide open. and fast. That's, that's all we know. That's all we know. And that's all we can do. We can't, we can't drill it back down. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Uh, what else? Is Speaking of seed packets, I wanted to uh, I want to talk about okra because one of those uh, ads we got running is on okra. We talked about the uh, the jambalaya okra. Let me get these in some kind of order here. We talked about the jambalaya okra uh, being our most popular variety in, in it of any crop, and it, it remains that. I want to show you some of these other varieties we have added this year. Uh, we're trying to kind of be an okra connoisseur with our seed lineup. And, yeah, uh, some people want some of these different <laughs> okras, and that's fine. And uh, we we know the jambalaya is productive. We 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 have been growing that for a while. We know how good it is, but uh, we don't always grow for just straight productivity. Sometimes we might grow for uniqueness or flavor or something like that. So I'm going to do a little okra trial and grow a row of, of five or six different varieties, and and we can have you know. Really talk about what the pluses and minuses sure. of each of them. Although the jambalaya is good, it is ideally picked at about three to four inches long. Some of these other varieties, if you can't get out there every other day and pick it, are more tender at longer length. A little more forgiving. Now, if you're doing strictly production, hands down, the jambalaya is one to go with. If you're wanting an heirloom variety or you want one that's more forgiving, one of these may fit the bill for you. So we got the red burgundy. We've talked about that one a ton. That one is a little more forgiving at the longer lengths. Um, and I, I always grow a little red burgundy every year along with my jambalaya. Now this Star of David here, we've grown that before. It's a shorter, stubbier, but it's a wider round. Okra makes a really good frying okra. Mm -hmm. Nice big old pieces if there. If you ain't ever had no frying okra, <laughs> you're missing out on something in life. Man, so, some of them people on that okra ad right on there, how do you eat okra? Ain't Ooh. never eaten no okra. And My poor mama could fry okra better than anybody I'd ever seen. This one here, really excited about trying. It's supposed to be really good and tender, the Silver Queen okra. And uh, so I'm gonna grow a row of that one. Looking forward to that one. Um, this cow horn okra, we've grown that before. It does good. You can let it get a little longer. And Folks out nice in Louisiana too. and out, out in that part of the world love this cow horn. Some of them call it longhorn, cow horn. Uh, yeah, that's a popular one. Uh, out Cajun that country. And then we got this Perkins long pod, which as the name suggests, you let that one get a little longer. And then the last one here, because uh we got some folks some customers <clears throat> who just like to till them up a plot and go scatter and throw some okra out there and to do that you just might as well get you some cheap okra seed yeah you don't want to do it with any high dollar okra seed like that jambalaya so we we added this clemson spineless which is probably the most popular variety out there because that's what all the hardware stores carry um so we added this uh and we kept selling a quarter pound or whatever for you folks out there who just like to kind of broadcast it. Or you folks out there that's really tight with your money. You can buy this in a quarter of a pound and it's a good bit cheaper. And I, I, we got a friend of ours, we call him Old Man Herod. He come over here last year and we didn't have this Clemson Spineless and he wanted some okra seed. So I go by there and pull the jambalaya and I pronounced to tell him all the benefits to it. And when I told him the price, he went throwing him a fit, shaking all over, talking ugly, carrying on. And I said, Old Man Herod, calm down. He said, I want some of that cheap seed. I said, well, if that's what you want, he was too tight. 
He calls himself way more work. He wants some of that cheap seed. I said, you just need to go to town buy you some of that cheap seed. So he got mad, flew up, and left out of here, went to town, bought him some of that cheap seed. So I said, this year, we're going to have some cheap seed for old man Harriet if he comes back because he, he just throws him a fit if it's very expensive. Now, he likes to plant that uh, Clemson Spinus simply because it's cheap. Some of y'all out there like that, you got a buddy like that, this is okra for you. Yep, that's right. Okay, one more thing. We were talking about our orders and our fast shipping and all that good stuff. We got some new stuff coming in the orders here. And um, if you've ordered from us within the last week or so, you may have gotten uh, something. So we started to put some stickers in the orders and we got some nice little stickers made here. Um, all the orders are going to include one of these, these nice little row by row stickers. And all these stickers are, are outdoor UV resistant stickers. So you can put them on your wheelbarrow, you can put them on your shed, uh, you can put them on your buggy, whatever you wanted to. So this, this looks just like our logo here. And then we've got some other ones here. We've got one, we started out with just a rectangular Hoss logo sticker, but we just got these in uh, that I'm really excited about. And uh, let me show you what we got here. So uh, one of them is a little vegetable basket with our logo on it. This is one I was thinking of you about because you was out there with, last year with your wheelbarrow full of pumpkins. So we've got a, a wheelbarrow with pumpkins in it. This is my favorite one right here because everybody knows I like to grow beets. So we got that one. Then we got this one right here with little hand tools on it. So there's four different ones. You could get either of these four when you place an order. It'll be completely random. It's kind of like getting a Happy Meal toy. You kind of got to collect all four. I you... wasn't real happy with none of the stickers. Yeah. So I didn't like the other day when they come in, they spread them out, called me in there, pick your favorite sticker. I said, ain't none of them my favorite. I don't like never one of them. You know why? It wasn't your idea. Exactly. Yeah. I submitted a couple ideas for the stickers, and my ideas got cut. Okay. So here we are. So here we are. So folks, tell me what you think about these. Tell me which one is your favorite. And uh, when you place an order, you'll get one of these and hopefully... Uh, when it comes sticker board. design time again, I'm going to submit my ideas again. You're going to resubmit them? I'm going to resubmit them. See if one of them finally will make the cut. Huh. I had some great ideas, I thought. But yeah. Yeah. Okay, so today's... Uh, <laughs> topic on the show we're going to talk about drip irrigation because it's yep. getting that time and drip irrigation man everybody gets confused and intimidated by it but folks that have used it man they love it so we want to answer some of those questions and concerns today that may, people may have on drip irrigation because it's really not that complicated <clears throat> but more than that we have made it easy for you the way we package things the way we put these kits together and everything we've took a lot of the problems out of it for you trying to figure out exactly what you need that's right. So we got a list here of what we consider the most frequently asked questions we get about drip irrigation. And like you mentioned, some people are very intimidated by it, but it's actually really simple. And we've got a lot. I don't think I've heard of one customer who went to drip that just hates it. Uh, everybody that's went to it is just, man, total game changer. Yep. Uh, and and if, if, if you're one of those customers who has recently went to drip, and uh, I know Miss Carol in Florida, she absolutely loves hers. Uh, but if you're one of those people who just kind of recently converted to drip, uh, in the comments there, um, tell everybody how it's changed the game for you so everybody else who's on the fence can feel more comfortable about making that decision. So let's get some props up here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll start bumping through these questions. We got about 14 or 15 of them. Okay, question number one or says, can I use drip tape irrigation with a gravity fed system? You can, but it, it's, it's pretty much unfeasible to do it. Uh, for a gravity fed system, you have to have the tank somewhere around 35, 40 feet off the ground to generate. You okay? I gotta drop something. I gotta get out of here and get it. Oh, oh, oh. All right. It's not it's Where not feasible to, it's, it's not feasible to use this thing with a gravity fed system if you have to put that tank that high nobody's really going to go to the problem or they don't need to go to the issue of putting a tank 35 feet in the air to try to feed this right here so can it be done yes is it uh 
people. You had to have a pump on, uh, on the other side of it if you didn't yeah, raise it there. It's just too much. Uh, I wouldn't advise doing it with a gravity fed system. Are you going? You need to take take a minute, take a deep breath. All right, go to number two while I get this. You about let me hold on to all this drip. All right, I got it. Okay. Question number two. Go ahead. Uh, should I bury it or place it on top of the ground? You can do whether it was designed to be buried or put under plastic mulch as well. It was designed. We bury it because we like to put it down out of sight and out of mind and get it out of the way of those varmints that can chew into it and keep it from getting blowed around by the wind. You get a good wind storm coming through there if you got it on top of the ground. This stuff decompresses when the pressure is off so it gets light and flimsy and it can move around. If you are going to put it on top of the ground and that's, you think that's the way you've got to do it, get you some solid staples and you can hold it down there. That will work but you definitely need something to keep it in place. Sod staples, I've seen that done before. That works the best. We like to bury it about yay, about yay deep. You know what yay deep is? About right, three or four uh, inches. We like to bury it like that, and it works out perfect for us. And you can bury it two ways. You can do it. We got that drip tape layer attached for the wheel hoe that works great. Or if you just got a wheel hoe with the plow set, you can do it that way too. Just takes a little longer. Either way, that wheel hoe making a furrow makes it really easy to bury. It's just, it's almost like, just like planting taters. So if you plant and drip tape. How do I know where the emitters are located once it is buried? I get this one a lot. And, and I guess if you've never used drip tape, it, it's hard to understand this, but uh, so you got emitters located every 12 inches along that tape there. And you can see where those emitters are on this eight mil tape. Uh, once you bury it and you turn that water on, in about 10, 15 minutes, depending on how dry your soil is, you'll start seeing these little water rings develop and they'll get larger and larger the longer you let it run. You'll know exactly, and then you can also stick your hand down there and you can feel that water coming Yeah, out. always, whether it be eight mil or 15 mil, your emitters get faced up when you put it down. Yeah, always. On the 15 mil, you have a seam right here and that water comes out that seam. So you can't see the emitters like you can on the 8 mil. Still same process. Every 12 inches they come out. Number four, can I plant between the emitters? Sure. Uh, if we're planting stuff like corn and things like that, we just plant on top of the... Let's scoot in a little closer oh, here. Okay. Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> we uh, we plant stuff like corn and things like that. We plant directly on top of it. We leave the drip tape on long enough so that it kind of meets in the middle there, makes a big enough spot. So sure, you can plant on top of it. It's planted in the middle of it. Now, on transplants on tomatoes and peppers, we like, watermelons, we like to plant on the emitters, but yeah. Yeah, it covers the gaps. You won't notice any difference in germination uh, whether those seeds are on the emitters or not. Can it be reused? It can be. Uh, that's just a matter of, of how frugal or how conservative you want to be. Uh, the way I do it with this eight mil tape is I'll put it down and when I'm done with the crop, I'll pull it up, leave it connected. I'll cultivate the area. I'll put it right back down and I may use a single piece of tape four to five times. I do never, I don't ever pull it up <laughs> i don't ever pull it up and try to store it. it it's just not i don't have a good way to store it and at, at about i think this stuff comes in about four or five cent a foot it's just not cost effective for me to try to find a way to store it so i'll use it four or five times because we're growing food year long and then i'll just replace it uh if you do want to find a way to store it you can certainly do that yep number six can I leave it in the ground over winter? Sure. So when you take the pressure off of this tape, it goes back flat. So it decompresses. So you shouldn't have any problem whatsoever with this stuff freezing because it's not got any, it hasn't got any water inside of it. So just leave it turned off, keep your water off of it. Water drains out of it and you should be good. Yeah, the coldest it ever gets here is about 15 degrees and I've never had it freeze it. I couldn't imagine, uh, because there's no water in it, it's really yeah. not, it completely decompresses. What's the difference between eight mil and 15 mil tape? So 15 mil tape is almost twice as thick as this eight mil tape. Um, the eight mil tape, I try to tell people this, is really designed for vegetables, for annuals. 
you know, what most of us are doing. The 15 mil tape is really more appropriate for perennials, blackberries, blueberries, raspberries, whatever, asparagus, that kind of stuff. The 15 mil is better if you're gonna put it somewhere, leave it, not touch it for five years. If you're pulling it up, moving around, uh, this eight mil works a lot better. It's just easier to work with. It's a little more flexible. It's easier to work with. Uh, now, if it, I do have some customers who insist on putting it on top of the ground. If you're doing that, you probably want to go to the 15 mil. You're going to get longer out of it uh, because any any kind of degradation there from the sun, they like the 15 we all, mil. Yeah, we all got that buddy that's always got to have the biggest gun or the biggest knife, knife or whatever. And he thinks he's going to get one up on you when he orders because he's going to get the 15 mil because it's thicker than the 8 mil. Well, he ain't done nothing because he's causing himself more trouble. This 8 mil works perfect for vegetable production it's a little more pliable and it's easier to work with so the eight mil is the cat's meow for vegetables now perennials different story but don't think he's getting one up on you or you getting one up on somebody else by the order in that 15 mil if you're going to plant vegetables the eight mil is easier to install it's just it's because it's thinner it slides on the fittings better it, and it just just trust us on that one folks it just works better can i water individual rows Yes. So uh, with our drip kits, we include this thing called a drip tape row start. Not this. We don't have one of those here. Uh, the drip tape row start is basically what is at the beginning of your drip tape lines. Uh, we do have these things called drip tape row start valves. So this is our row start with a valve on it there. And so you can use this to turn off or turn on individual rows. Where this is handy is if you've got lots of, uh, a large variety of crops in the same space there. Uh, say you got some onions, but you also got some tomatoes. You don't want to give those tomatoes near the water. You want to give those onions, something like that. You can control that. Also, if you're using our Easy Flow injector, uh, you want to fertilize the you know what out of your corn or onions but maybe not the other stuff this is going to allow you to kind of control that on a per row basis well said thank you uh number nine how long do i let it run well we get that question a lot don't we and it's it's very i mean it depends a lot it depends on the <clears throat> climate the temperature depends on your crop Depends on depends soil. on the soil type. There's a lot of different things in there. It's one of the things you kind of have to get the feel for. If you're watering with a water sprinkler, it's the same way. You kind of have to water till it gets wet. Now it's easy to tell. People, some people got this idea of things they don't know how much water it's putting out and it bothers them. You can tell when you walk out there, you can tell how much water you got out there because it's going to soak around where that emitter is. Yeah, the, the yeah. soil will be a different color where the water from these emitters. You're going to get the feel of it real quick. Now, I, I put new transplants in on those 12-inch emitters. I may just water for 10 minutes. As those crops get bigger and demand more water, it takes me longer to water. When my corn is tasseling and, and is in dire need of water and it's hot and dry, may let it run all night so it just depends on a lot of different factors there and you'll you'll figure it out yeah when i water my onions i'll run it all night yep number it's your turn number 11. how much volume can it handle or how much pressure can it handle well that's the question we get a lot how much pressure it can handle but it's actually volume that we want to talk about pressure makes no difference whatsoever because this thing right here which we sell in our kit we sell them individually too is something that you have to have on drip irrigation now if you think you're gonna get cheap like old man Harry and do without this right here you're gonna cause yourselves lots of issues because you're gonna blow all your fittings out and you're gonna blow your irrigation emitters out and you're gonna have water going everywhere and you're gonna say well what happened well, you didn't use a pressure regulator like them boys told you to. So you got to have this. This is in our kit that we sell already put together with a filter regulator and everything you need. Turn key. What this does is reduces your pressure. So it doesn't matter how much pressure you got coming in this. This thing's going to bring it down to 12 pounds. Now you got to have at least 12 pounds. I tell people you need at least 15 pounds. So you come in this for 15 pounds or more, it's going to reduce it down to 12 pounds, and that's simple. Now, volume's a different thing. You cannot run more than eight gallons a minute through this right here, or it will cause it to malfunction. So if you got one of those high power wells out there that's pumping a lot of water, you got to restrict it down to eight gallons a minute or less to make this work properly. 
And the way I do that is I just bring my gate valve down and uh, bring my volume down to make this work right. If you're over eight gallons a minute, it's going to make this thing go haywire and it's not going to restrict it and you're going to have problems with blowing some uh, some fittings out. Yeah, so the range on this is, is uh, anywhere from a half gallon to eight gallons a minute. You can use this one. I will say this, the, this same one right here, they the company that makes these, I can't hold oh, on to this one. <laughs> They do make one for higher than eight gallons a minute. We don't sell them because when we decided to do this drip thing, we wanted to keep everything real simple and uh, j just kind of uh, really easy. But uh, you can out there find one if you've got over eight gallons a minute and have a hard time throttling it down, you can get a regulator uh, that takes it down to 12 PSI. Uh, it's a little bigger than this for that really high flow. Most of your home residential wells out there is going to run around five gallons per minute. And you're going to be fine with this. Mine's at mine's right at about eight, but not over. So uh, I'm usually fine. What we got next here? Can I use it on raised beds? I'm going to let you take that one. Uh, yes, yes, you can. Um, so the tape itself is going to work just as good in a raised bed as it would in an in-ground garden. The thing you have to figure out with the raised beds is your main line manifold or setup. So um, it's a little more aggravating. But once you kind of figure it out, it, it's not that bad. You, you're going to need a lot more what we call tees and elbows because you basically are going to, that main line is going to run along the ground mm -hmm. between your raised beds. You could bury it if you wanted to uh, so you didn't trip over it. And then once you get to the raised beds with that main line, you got to use a T and then a, probably an elbow to get that thing up to the top or the, the soil level of the raised bed. Once you get up there, it's the same game as an in-ground garden. Uh, some people ask me how many of uh, how many lines of tape do I need to put in my raised bed? And I said, well, how many rows of crop are you planting? Uh, you, you know, I wouldn't, a lot of people just want to say, well, I want to put two or three lines in there and just have the whole bed watered. I wouldn't look at it that way. I would look at it, you know, cause you're gonna plant right on top of this stuff. Look at it uh, particular to what crop you're doing. Do you plant on top of it or to the side of it? Well, I'm planting corn, peas, things like that that I direct seed. I just plant on top of it. I like to bear in mind again about yay deep and I plant on top of it there and don't have any problems whatsoever. If I'm using transplants, I come to the side of the emitter and I'll dig down to the right beside, try to get as close as I can to that emitter and I'll plant right beside that emitter. Transplants right there to the side, direct seeding on top, no problems whatsoever. And that helps you a little bit with your weed control, which is the next one. Yeah, well, I have a lot of people asking me with uh, tomatoes, they'll say, Am I, you planting your tomatoes right on top of it to the side? Well. Like you said, this thing's only buried three to four inches deep. You're going to plant your tomatoes yep. deeper than that. So that's why you want to go. You can go to either right or side. Now, I try to with my tomatoes. And this is just a little pro tip for y'all. When I'm doing this, uh, I'll put my tomatoes on one side of the tape all along the row. And then I'll put my steaks on the other side of the tape oh, all along oh. the row. And uh, it just helps you, you keep everything mm. uh, nice and organized there. Mm. You must have been watching me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was your idea. Last one here. How do you keep from hitting it with the hoe? And we get this a lot too. And uh, that's the reason we bury it. And that's the reason we plant on top of it. That's the reason we put it out of the way. And uh, you want for the most part. Now, we do plant, I plant a lot of stuff on double rows. Um, and, and in that case, you've, until the crops grow up to cover that gap, you've got the little gap there, but our little single tine cultivator, you might see me do that on video, yeah. uh, works perfect for skimming along and taking care of that. I will say this, if you're gonna be out there hoeing and working around the buried tape, even if you don't think you're gonna hit it, turn it off. Don't, uh, it, when this stuff is off, even if you do skim it with a hoe, there is a good chance Unless that hose razor, razor sharp, you'll be okay. If this stuff is on and inflated, it's pretty easy uh, to poke a hole in. If you have real high weed pressure in your garden, you probably want to use the single rows. The double rows work fine, and you can increase production on that. You can do a lot more intensive growing on the double row. However, it is a little bit harder to weed. So if you got a high weed pressure, do the single rows, and you'll find yourself that that works a little bit better for you.
speaking from experience. Yes, weed, exper pressure. weed pressure. Yeah. All right. So if there are any questions, and I'm sure there are, about drip tape or drip irrigation uh, that we didn't answer, and we probably need to do another show where we just show our kit and kind of show how a yeah. turnkey it is put together. But if there's any other questions about drip irrigation that we didn't answer, uh, put those in the comments below, and we'll be glad to take care of that for Let's you. Let's do some questions. Let's do some questions. We've got some questions from last week, and if we answer your question on the show, send us an email to cussserve at hosstools.com. We'll send you a nice little prize, maybe one of these new nice little stickers. Here. Mm. Question number one from The Rural Life says, What are some crops that you plant that goes against tradition as far as extending the planting season, like growing winter squash in spring? <clears throat> Or lettuce in summer. Well, I don't know if this is a typo or, or uh, misunderstanding here or what, but uh, growing winter squash in spring would not be going against tradition. That's that's what we do. Well, it's what we do, and you can. A lot of people grow them in spring, but you can also a lot of people grow them in the in what we call summer for fall crop. Right, right. But it is not winter. It's not. It's a little misconceiving. Right. Um, so we do try to push the limits of what we can grow in certain seasons. I certainly do that. I'll try, I'll be planting beets right up until when it gets hot. And I usually, my last planting of beets never makes it because I'm always pushing, pushing that, that kind of limit there. And, and I know when I can't plant beets anymore because I've yep. transplanted some and the, the heat will kill them. Just like with lettuce. I mean, we can't grow lettuce in, in the middle of the hot summer. Yeah. There's some things you just can't can't do. Uh, but but we try to push the limits, but we don't ever try to flip the seasons on anything. We try to keep it within reason yep. somewhat. Number two, uh, J.R. French says, I ended up with tomato wilt last year and lost all my plants. Sad news there. Mm. I've heard that once it's in your soil, you can't get rid of it. Is this true or can you treat it with something? JR, you, you've been fed some bad information there. Tomato spotted whip virus is spread by insects through the wind. It's a virus spread by thrips. So the two ways to control it is by planting a virus resistant variety, which I would highly recommend, and also trying to control your thrips. Start early with an insecticide program to work on those thrips and a good uh, virus resistant variety there will help you tremendously. However, blight, which is a bad problem in tomatoes, is soil borne. So make sure you understand what you got and then kind of go after it and understand the corrective measure you need to make to be successful growing tomatoes. Blight affects a lot of tomatoes. I have early blight. Some people have early blight and late blight. It is soil borne. You have to do some different things to help control that. But the virus is not soil borne. Hello, somebody's calling. I actually was doing some research the other day, already kind of thinking about varieties to add for next year, and I found a variety of tomato that is resistant to late blight. Hmm. Uh, uh, I wanted to mention one thing about the soil-borne tomato diseases, uh, and we've talked about this a little bit before. Folks, when them tomatoes, when they own kind of the rear end of their production window, and and the plants start looking a little sorry and your insect pressure gets high, get them out of there. Don't hold on for a few more tomatoes uh, because all you're doing is just festering disease and insect pressure. Yeah. And don't leave, I, I, would, I know you don't always believe in this, but my theory is get them plants, pull them up, get them as far away from that garden as you can, put them in a burn pile. Oh, I uh, agree with that. Don't, my, don't compost tomato plants. My problem is I always want to get that last tomato. Yeah. I'm guilty of that right there. I always want to get yeah. that last tomato. You got little. no one to give up. You Same got, thing with squash. Yep. You got no one to give up. Jeremy Edgeworth says, I am looking at planting a warm weather cover crop on a garden plot this spring and summer for a fall garden. What would you recommend planting and when? Is there a specific thing or a mix Thanks and keep up the great shows. So the the warm weather cover crops is a little different than the cool weather. The cool weather we can we can play around and and be a little bit of a chemist to make some cocktails. With the warm ones, it, it's harder to do that because they they all kind of got different dates they come off for different maturity times. Uh, it's going to depend on what your window is. If you got a real short window, buckwheat's great. That's going to be four or five weeks. You know, real you know just within a month there. Um, if you're looking for something to, that's going to go for three or four months, you, you need to do the sorghum sedan grass. And I did this last year, and it works like a charm. 
plant you some sorghum sedan grass plant it thick i'm talking about thick double or maybe at least double the rate we have listed of uh, putting it out once it gets about two foot tall go in there put your lawnmower on its highest setting and uh, go in there and mow it and then every time it gets it'll grow back pretty quick when it gets two foot tall again mow it again and just keep mowing it until you're ready to grow there then you can till it in and the addition of those grass clippings over time is just going to do wonder, especially if you've got some poor tilt, it's just going to make, uh, build that organic matter and, and do wonders for your soil. Sorghum sedan grass is a great cover crop. It's a low maintenance cover crop. It's easy. The one that gives you the most bang for your buck, hands down, is the sun hemp. And the sun hemp is more, has a little more issues to it. It's a little harder to get rid of. This guy has more of a thicker stalk on there, but it does more for the soil than anything I have found. I got a pasture out there that I grew a big patch of sun hemp this last summer. I come in there and tilled it in, harried it, cut it in, and planted oaks behind it. No fertilizer whatsoever, and my oaks were wonderful, scavenging off from those nutrients that that sun hemp banked up for. So, Sorghum sedan grass is a great one. Low maintenance, if you want to put it out there and not have to worry about it. The most bang for your buck, the biggest return on investment is going to be sun hemp. Yeah, the, the only downside of the sun hemp, like you mentioned, once it gets real big, you need more than just a regular lawnmower to cut down. You need a bush yeah. hog or a, a flail mower or something. Number four, city girl, country heart. Uh, <laughs> what different types of collard greens have you grown? And what would be your top pick if you could only grow one? Mm, I've grown them all. Over the years, we've grown all kind of collards. Back in the day, we didn't have much of a choice. We grew the vates. Right. Nowadays, we got some hybrid varieties that are outperforming them, doing wonderful. Top bunch is, is probably the one I plant about all the time now. Planted the, the, the tiger and all the And I'll be honest with you, I can't tell much difference in the taste of any of those hybrids. The vates... Compared to these hybrids, they are different in the growth habitat. These hybrids will outperform them. And if you're growing a few rows of the collards, by all means, use those top bunch. That's the way to go. If you're really struggling with your money and you're tight and like throw fits like old man Harrod does, and you want to go out there and broadcast them and you don't want to spend much money, that vates is the way to go. I, I plant the, uh, you know, I like to look after my stuff, plant it in rows, tend to it. Top bunch is the way to go. Yeah, yeah. If you're going to till you up a spot, throw the seed out there and you're going to single cut them, go with the cheap ones like the vates. And we may end up carrying some vates just for old man Herod and uh, his crew. Uh, if you're going to grow them in rows and you're going to crop them like, like I do and like he does and take a little better care of them, those hybrids are, are certainly the way to go. All right, that's it. I feel, man, I feel like we covered a lot tonight. A lot of information I like, there. I feel like folks is just now with a notepad. I mean, it. it well, everybody's not. got spring fever, and it's that time of the year. Well, I tell you, I get a, I get a bad case of it too. Old Hunter Clark come by here the other day, and he's a young fella, had his daughter with him, and he, I could see it in his eyes. He had, I said, you got it bad, don't? He said, I got it bad. He's wanting to get out there and plant stuff, and I'm the same way. A couple pretty sunshine days you want to go out there and plant the world you feel like doing something other you feel like you're going to need to be productive and and make a change and grow you some good vegetables and that's that time to get you inspired yeah i, I know better but i'm this close to planting me some beans mm. hold off and uh it, I've, I've got the itch bad i've got the itch bad so I, folks you need to what i'm trying to say is y'all need to get off my couch and get your dirt ready that's right get ready get you if you're going Make the plunge and go with drip this year. Get that stuff. Get ready. We got a kit. Makes it real easy. Uh, we want to thank everybody for watching out there. As always, don't keep us a secret. If you enjoyed this video, give us a big like. Give us a big thumbs up and a big share. And we will see you guys next time. Take care.